again, I just want to pause for a moment. Just to invite your presence here. Lord, these bumbling lips need an anointing of your spirit. As we share a wonderful topic tonight, Lord, I just pray there'll be understanding that we'll come to a realization of how much you love us and that how much you want us to be with you forever. Lord, thank you for every person here tonight. Open our hearts now, we pray. Amen. I don't know how many of you remember back in 2010. That's what, 13 years ago now. There were 33 miners that were trapped down in an underground cave, a copper and gold mine in northern Chile. You guys remember that? What a story. 17 days after the collapse, that's two and a half weeks, as the workers finally removed this drill bit, about an inch in diameter, which they were just kept boring, where they needed to get fresh air, they needed to somehow reach that cave where they were, they were trapped. Finally, that drill bit completed that borehole. And wouldn't you know it, when they pulled it out, they found a handwritten note on that drill bit that says, we're all well in the shelter, all 33. Oh, I can remember I got choked up that night when I listened and I saw that on the news. Can you imagine together these 33 miners surviving 69 days underground? Now through that little hole, they, they, you know, they started boring it bigger and bigger and you know, sending food and water and supplies. How those 33 survived. Did you find my phone? Yes, I did. Thank you, my brother. Now I'll be able to concentrate. <laughs> 69 days underground. Wow. So the day came. Those miners, one by one, were winched out of that cavern. An estimated 1.5 billion people around this planet watched on television as those jubilant, happy families and, and the, the president and the military leaders and, and national leaders from all over, that South, all over South America greeted those heroic men who emerged from that hole. What a story. Amazing story. The last miner, when he came out, he held up a giant sign that said, Mission accomplished, Chile. Mission accomplished, Chile. Chile strong. That rescue was an incredible success. And there's a whole lot of people that were, got out of boys. Tonight, we're going to be talking in detail about a rescue, a story from the Bible that is even more, even more thrilling than that exciting rescue that took place in Chile. And unlike the fear and, and dread of the many doomsday predictors, the Bible's account of the rescue, of how this world is going to end, is filled with hope. It's a positive, it's a good old boy one. War, famine, disease, all the ailments of this journey have taken their toll on humanity. But God's word makes it very plain to us that humanity is not going to die out because of these disasters, as bad as they may be. But instead, the Bible tells us very clearly that the world will end with this triumphant return of Jesus to this earth. And we want to talk about that tonight. He will return to the same earth that he left almost 2,000 years ago. And time will end as we know it at, when, he, when he returns. 
and eternity will begin. I don't know if you've ever had this thought. You kind of start spiraling in your mind. I can remember maybe I was five or six years old and I'm laying out in the wheat field in Saskatchewan, Canada, looking up at, this, at the clouds going over and, and I'm trying to imagine where heaven is. And I closed my eyes in this thought, just think. If I'm a good boy, I'll be able to go to heaven and I'll never die. I'll live forever. And I just couldn't get my mind around forever and ever. But that's what the Bible promises. Friends, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, is coming soon. And there's no doubt that the problems of this world are beyond help for humanity. I mean, we've, we've tried everything. We're, we're, you know, we've got a lot of technology, and we tend to pride ourselves on all of our smarts, but look where we are. Only Jesus Christ and his Father are capable of straightening out this mess. The overwhelming problems of this planet. What a blessing it'll be when the King of King, Kings and the Lord of Lords returns. But as I stand before you tonight, there's some confusion. There's some <coughs> discrepancies, I guess would be a word, about how that all is going to take place. The Apostle Paul, if you know anything about his life, his last years, he was a prisoner in this dark, damp, the Mamertine prison He's sitting there waiting for the executioner to come to behead him. He knew what was coming. He knew what his fate was. But he writes this letter. He writes this letter to his friend Titus, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, as Paul was in that prison, even then he knew where the blessed hope was. And Paul wrote this encouraging letter to Titus. His, he calls him the, his true son of the, in the faith. Tr to remind Titus of the glorious coming of our Lord Jesus. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. Friends, if you find that your life at times has dark nights of discouragement, look up and remember this. That blessed hope that Paul talks about. The coming of Jesus to this earth. Everything's all right in my Father's house. At that time, everything will be all right. The most talked about event in the New Testament is the second coming of Christ. One out of 25 verses relate to the second coming. That would indicate to me that that's pretty important. Something to do with the second coming. So Christ himself spent more time talking about that special event than any other topic in the New Testament. And one of the best known promises that he spoke is found in John, the 14th chapter. And I bet you some of you know it by heart. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, oh, these are the words. I, I might come back. No. I will return. I go to a, place, a prepare a place for you. I think I've, I, let's see, where did I go? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself. And here it is, that where I am, there you might be also. Amen. Over the centuries, whenever disappointment or hardship or death have threatened Christ's followers, that promise, this I call it the star of hope, that promise of his return has brought courage and strength 
to many to endure whatever trials, whatever circumstances you might be facing. 2 Timothy 4. Later in his life, as the executioner stood by just steps away, Paul triumphantly, he proclaimed, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the, the race and I have kept the faith. I don't know, over the last few years, I'm trying to remember who it was that made, hey, keep the faith, brother, keep the faith, keep the faith. That's where it comes from, kept the faith. You know, Paul, he continues by saying, finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, here, but to all who have loved his appearing. To all who, in other words, he's saying, for all of those who have come to an understanding what God, what Jesus, what he's going to be doing for us, what he's, what he's got prepared for us. Well, so here we have Paul, who can valiantly face the executioner's sword on that faithful day, and he can make that kind of a claim. Because you see, he, he had faith in Christ's promise that Christ was, Christ was going to return and he was going to be with him. Friends, it's a fact. Jesus will return. Amen. Not maybe. I, he said, I will return. And, Je and, and Jesus' promise to his disciples belongs to us tonight as well. Jesus will come again. You see, when the disciples, the, you know, they, they asked what the signs of his coming would be towards the end of time. We talked a lot about that last night. Jesus gave a detailed account of the events that would take place just before his return. And we find some of them mentioned in Matthew 24. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you. He probably knew that there was the same deceiver that got Adam and Eve. He was still alive and well. And Jesus answered them, for many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ. And will deceive many. And then in verse 24, Jesus elaborates on this issue. He says, for false Christs, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Friends, it's impossible to mistake the real coming of Jesus. No one could do that. But we could be taken by a counterfeit, a counterfeit and be fooled before Christ appears. I want you to think about it. You see, Christ talks a lot about that deception. And if we don't know how to tell the difference, how to spot a counterfeit from the real, we may attach ourselves to an imposter, thinking that he's Christ. That's what Christ warned. Jesus warned that it could happen. And he wasn't talking about a few clumsy deceptions. Eventually, he was speaking about incredible impersonations. So carefully planned and executed that almost the whole world could be deceived. The verse we read. That he could deceive even, what, the very elect. That means the ones who are supposedly smart and educated. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So that same sneaky devil that transformed himself into a serpent in the garden, has a whole bunch of other tricks up his sleeve. 
So what would such an imposter be like? He may wear clothes just like we think uh, Jesus would wear, clothes that would fit his appearing. They may speak kind and in a melodious voice, quoting scripture, seeming very wise. They may even attract thousands, large followings of people. Would that be an indicator of a true Messiah, true prophet? They may even heal people and do marvelous signs and wonders. And the temptation may be overwhelming to doubt what the Bible says. See, it says many will be deceived. Friends, here's the point. We dare not trust our senses, what we hear, what we see, and how we feel. There's only one safe guide for determining whether someone is genuine or an imposter. And that is the word of God. Pure and simple. There's where it is. Now, for a few minutes, let's consider a few of the signs or features that are unique to Christ's second coming so we won't be deceived. First of all, Christ's second coming is visible. It's a visible event. Matthew 24, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, until I was 10 years old, I lived on a little farm up in Saskatchewan, Canada, in the prairies. And let me tell you what, when we got a thunder and a lightning storm, it was scary for a little Eight, nine-year-old, that little lightning and the thunder blasting. If you've ever been in one of those thunder and lightning storms, there's no secret about it. It's visible. Revelation 1, 7, I read, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Now, I've had people get in conversation with him. Jody, right there. That shows you how stupid the Bible is. The earth is a globe. How are you going to get the people on the other side of, you know, how are you get the people in Australia to see? You know what my answer is? If God could take five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 people, I'm sure he's got a way he can put some kind of refractors up there and just have, just the whole world to see him at the same time. That, that, that's, that's not a problem with me at all. But the Bible says it's a visual, visible event. Every eye will see him. No one but Jesus can make an appearance like that. So that we won't be seen by imposters, the Bible tells us exactly in what manner Jesus will return. And will, it will be in the, same, very, in the very same way that he left. It was a very visible event, not secret, not mysterious. You know the story after Jesus had finished his work on this earth. He was about ready to leave this earth and ascend to heaven. He gathered all of his buddies together, all of his friends, those closest followers of his. And he took those close followers of his out to the Mount of Olives, and after he had given them instructions and said his farewell, suddenly he was taken up into heaven. Let's notice what the Bible says about this event. Acts, the first chapter. Now when he had spoken these things, while they, were, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, you men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So here we have two angels that God commissioned to come to assure and to comfort the disciples, give them the words of promise that they need, that Jesus 
had given them that would be fulfilled. Jesus had said plainly what they would see. Luke 21. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Wow. No one will have to tell you when Jesus comes, just so you know. You will see him coming in the clouds, but there are other characteristics that the devil cannot duplicate. Let's look at this. Jesus will not be coming back here by himself. He won't be alone. Oh, I, I, I like my imagination just to run away with me sometime. It will be the most glorious sight. For Matthew 25 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Then he will sit on his throne in his glory. And he will send his angels with great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Do you get that picture? From one head of heaven to the other. Yes. This verse tells us that Jesus will be, be accompanied by a multitude of holy angels filling the sky, filling the sun, sky from horizon to horizon, indescribable glory. Now you know why false Christs will, will have an impossible try, time trying to impersonate, to duplicate Jesus' return. It's impossible. No one can. But not only will the coming of Christ be visible and glorious, it'll also be audible. Every eye will see him. What about, what kind of sounds are we going to, what's going to happen? It'll be an audible coming, and the righteous dead are raised back to life. They're called to life. We, we talked about this last night. We read this verse, but I'll share it with you again in 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. With a shout, with the voice of an archangel. So it's going to be audible. Christ's coming will, will not only see it happening, will be heard by everyone. So penetrating will be that call, that sound of the trumpets, that the dead in Christ will come out of their graves. Whoa. I have often thought, what would it be like to be standing or being in the vicinity of a graveyard when Jesus returns. Wow. Can you just imagine the joy when those graves are opened, families are reunited? Do you see how impossible it would be for Satan to counterfeit the real coming of Christ? This just wouldn't happen. But there's still more good news. Notice what happens to the righteous, the righteous living at Christ's second coming. First Thessalonians, again, we read in chapter 4. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Oh my. We'll be caught up to meet them in the air. You see, the faithful followers of Jesus, they're caught up with those resurrected dead to meet the Lord in the air. And I can just imagine their reunion, families that have been separated by death, being united eternally, reunited. Paul gives us more details of what will happen when Christ returns. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. You see what he's referring to here? 
For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. See, God will give every follower of Jesus his gift of love, his, give, uh, his gift of everlasting life. Everything else, friends, will be meaningless at that time. Philippians 3, we read, we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Wow. A body like Christ's. Boy, I don't know how worthy I am of that. But just think, no more aches, no more pains. I like to think of it, oh, we be, we'll be... We'll be 21 years old forever. I kind of think, in my journey, 21 was when I had the most energy, and we're going to be 21 forever. What news could be more welcome? Mm. Now, there's another class of people. The second coming will not be welcome news for this class. Listen to how the Bible describes the the last earth-shaking events of history. In the book of Revelation 6, 14, we, we read, And then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Friends, again, the enemy cannot duplicate that one. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? So many people. There's a, there's a, a reality when people, when, when the expression comes, he was scared to, he was scared to death. Have you ever heard somebody say that, scared? That's exactly what that's saying is men's hearts failing them for fear. All, all these whack job Christians that have been talking about Jesus coming all these years, and I've been laughing at them and scoffing them and, and poking fun of them, and here, they, here he's coming, their hearts will stop, boom, right then. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Revelation 16 continues. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. You look through the course of time, and there have been some pretty massive earthquakes. I think that one down in Haiti a few years ago, they killed, what, 150,000 people? I think of that earthquake that, that set off that tsunami in, in Japan. But this tells us that this is going to be an earthquake that is so severe that it's never, ever been experienced on this earth. This earthquake will break down the cities of the earth. No one on this planet could possibly miss an earthquake like this. And it ushers in the coming of Christ. Friends, <clears throat> there's nothing secret about this. Jesus warned that his, that his coming would be at a time when no one was expecting. And he also said that people would be busy wasting their lives in foolish pleasure. We find it in Matthew 24, we're told when Jesus returns, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Now, this is what Jesus says would happen to those who are not ready for that day. They're lost, and they know it. The tribes of the earth mourn. What a sad picture, when it could have been so different. Friend, that day is going to be for real, and it's a lot closer than we think. There'll be no waking up to find out there was only a dream. Nothing is more important on earth than being ready to meet Jesus when he comes. 
I mean, how fragile are the earthly treasures that we prize and we think are so great? My dad was a game lover. He loved table games. But especially he was really good at word games. He could play word games even just a few months before he died. Late stages of dementia and all He could still beat you in a word game. But back in the day, I remember how much he loved to play Monopoly. How many of you know how to play Monopoly? Little Jimmy, he and his grandmother loved to play Monopoly as well. But yet, Jimmy always lost to Grandma. Because Grandma knew how to play the game. And she knew how to play it successfully. You see, in Monopoly, the name of the game is Acquisition. You mortgage everything to the hilt to buy more utilities or whatever it might be. And pretty soon, you get to a place where you're master of the board. And when you're master of the board, everybody else sits there fear and trembling because it's only a matter of time that your little race car marker is going to land on boardwalk or park place one too many times. You're going to hand over the last of your money and you're going to say, I lost again. And grandma would say to little Timmy, one of these days, you're going to learn how to play the game, how to play it. Sure enough, one summer, little Timmy, he knew neighbor boy Stevie moved in next door and they both loved playing Monopoly. And he played and he finally, that summer, he came to realize what grandmother had been showing him all these years. That acquisition was the name of the game. And would you know it, he learned how to play that game and he couldn't wait. He couldn't wait for grandma to come back over to the house. School year started, there grandma was. Ah, he's sitting around that little card table. Monopoly board spread in front of him. Well, Timmy says it this way. He said, I can still remember. It took place at Marvin Gardens. That's the yellow one, in case you remember. I took every dollar that Grandma had. I destroyed her financially and psychologically. It was the greatest moment of my life. But then Grandma had some words for me. She says, well, now, Timmy, now that the game is over, it all goes back in the box. Now that the game is over, it all goes back in the box. No, Grandma. No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't put it back in the box. I, I, I want Mom and Dad and all my friends to see what a great player I am. I mean, you know, why don't you just bronze this thing and, you know. No, no Timmy, it all goes back in the box. I think you see where that story is going for all of us. When the game is over, it all goes back in the box. But yet, look how much time and energy and resources we invest in the temporary versus the eternal. And that's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, these treasures that you have, they're fragile. They're nothing. One earthquake and they're going to be gone. The book of Luke. We read these words, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all of these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I don't know about you, but that's my prayer. Now, let's just review quickly what we've learned thus far as we've studied the Bible together. False prophets and, fall, and Christ will try to deceive everyone. The devil will appear as an angel of light. The second coming will not be a secret. 
Every eye will see Jesus. All the holy angels will come with Jesus. He'll come with the blast of a trumpet. He'll come with a shout of the archangel. The righteous dead will be resurrected. The righteous living will be translated without seeing death. All the righteous will be given immortality. All of earth's ungodly people will mourn when they see Jesus. A great earthquake will destroy the earth. All the lost will be slain. The second coming will come as a surprise to many, many people. But praise God, it won't be a surprise to those who are waiting and watching for it. The Apostle Paul assures the believers that they have nothing to fear in anticipation of Christ's returns. We read this in 1 Thessalonians 5. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You're all sons of, of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. You get that picture? Oh, I love that. I love that imagery. You're all sons of light and the sons of the day. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus coming is not a secret. We already saw that in Revelation 1, 7, that every eye will see him. 1 Thessalonians 4, he'll descend from heaven with a shout, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. In Noah's day, there were two classes of people. One class was taken into the ark and saved, and the other class was left behind and destroyed by the flood. In Lot's day, there were two classes of people. One taken out of the city and saved. One left in the city and consumed by fire. Friends, it'll be exactly that same way when Christ comes. Luke 17, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, in that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who's in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife? Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. And I tell you, in that night, there'll be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. The two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken, saved, the other and left, destroyed. And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? So he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered. Friends, this clarifies a point that the wicked will be destroyed when Jesus returns. But now let's be clear. I wish I had the whole evening to talk about this theology that has gripped most of the Christian churches that is based on one passage of Scripture. One passage of Scripture and is given a theology that basically gives people a second chance. It's called the secret rapture. That the Lord is going to Come some in the middle of the night, you're going to wake up in the morning and all the good people are going to be gone. They're going to be raptured. I believe in a rapture, but I don't believe in a secret rapture. The word rapture means Jesus returning. And they base their past, they base that theology on this passage that I just read. But let's be clear. Those that are taken are those who are saved and those who are left are the ones whose bodies are strewn all over the earth. But that secret rapture theology has it the other way around. They say those that are taken are the ones who are lost. And those who are left are the ones that Jesus is going to come and he's going to take them to heaven with them. It's totally, it's totally backwards. Let's look at another passage that is often used concerning this secret rapture. And that's 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 through 4. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, 
You have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Oh, there it is. See? But here's the problem. When they say peace and safety, then destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Here's the point. Take this with you tonight. Each reference to Jesus coming as a thief is in reference to the expected time of Jesus, not the manner of his coming. And there's a huge difference. He comes quickly as a thief, unexpectedly as a thief, but he comes in glorious splendor as the lightning shines from east to the west, that triumphant glory that is not a secret. We have a couple little brochures in the back that Brother Alvin is going to have available that goes into a lot more detail about the myths about the secret rapture. Friends, it's a false theology that basically says those righteous are going to heaven, and then they have this time of, excuse me, I'm trying to, the, the, the word is there, but it's escaped me. But that those who are left, they have a, they have a three and a half year period of time to get their act together. Tribulation, thank you. Show me that in the Bible. It's been conjured up based on that one passage of Scripture. So let's be clear. Those who are taken are saved, and those who are left are destroyed. The second coming of Jesus, which a, you can refer to as a rapture if you want, is not a secret event. This whole notion of being snatched away. There's a movie that came out a few years ago, Left Behind. Left Behind. If you can find the book, there's a wonderful book that a wonderful theologian, pastor friend of mine, Dwight Nelson, wrote. And the title of the book is What Left Behind, Left Behind. And it goes into much greater detail about this theology that has so many Christians deceived. So for those who are walking in the light of God, in the light of God's word, the glorious return of Jesus, the second coming, will be a most wonderful day. With inexpressible joy, God's people, They'll behold the realization that their hopes and their dreams, the fulfillment of Jesus' promises that they have believed in and they have trusted their whole lives, they won't be frightened. They won't be surprised. But they will triumphantly exclaim in the book of Isaiah, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and with smiles in their face, and he will save us. Can you get that picture? As the graves are open, the living righteous and the risen saints there unite their voices in that long, glad shout of victory. The Bible says they are changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. So here's the deal. All these blemishes, all these deformities, that's what's being left behind. Praise God. What a wonderful day that will be, friends. As angels gather, the elect. The elect is another word for those faithful followers from the four winds, from the four corners of the earth, from one end of heaven to the other. Little children carried by holy angels to their mother's arms. I love that, so I love that thought. Friends, long separated by death, are you reunited? Exactly one year ago today, probably my closest, dearest cousin, younger than me, 
tragically died. But I don't have to say goodbye to Bob. See you in the morning. I'm going to see you in the morning. Never again to part with songs of gladness we'll ascend together to the city of God and upon the heads of, of all the overcomers, those who have trusted and fallen in love with Jesus, on the heads of those, every one of those, with Jesus' own hand, he's going to place a crown of glory. Great songwriter, one of my favorite composers, been singing with greater vision for years. His name is Rodney Griffin. Look it up on YouTube if you want. But he wrote a song based on this thought. The name of the song is Pile of Crowns. Think about the pile of crowns that's going to be there at the feet of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but the very first thing I'm doing is I'm taking that crown and I'm laying it at his feet. And I'm saying, thank you, Jesus. I don't deserve this, but you've made me worthy. Unutterable joy filling the lips of God's children. Every heart, every voice is raised in grateful gratitude, in grateful praise. And then before this multitude of the redeemed, then we see the holy city, New Jerusalem, with its gates open wide. <laughs> and here all of God's children who have kept his commandments and have had the patience of Jesus enter. And there they behold the paradise of God. The home of Adam and Eve before they sinned. Friends, then there's that voice. I, I like to think maybe it's because I just when I think of a melodious voice, I think that Jesus or God, is, his voice is going to be kind of this deep resonating, echoing kind of a bass voice, richer than any music that ever fell upon mortal ear. And he's going to utter, your conflict has ended. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. I don't know about you, but I want to hear those words. There's nothing on this earth that I want to trade for hearing Jesus speak those words to me. And this could be our privilege, every one of us. It's actually our destiny if we choose to be ready for that day. Jesus invites us. Every day we can make the choice. The thing that Jesus honors more than anything else is our power of choice. So for me, I have to make a conscious choice each day to say, okay, Lord, again today I choose you. We're not going to get into a theology discussion about some people believed in the once saved, always saved theology, that once you give your heart to Jesus, once that's it, you can go and live the rest of your life the way you want. Oh, no, no. We could spend a whole evening talking about that. Every day we have to make a conscious decision. Whose side are we on? And if we say, Lord, I choose you today. Take me just as I am. Prepare me for your coming. And he invites us to simply trust his word. His promises, his love, he has never failed us. He's never failed us. And so he invites us again tonight to make the choice to be part of his eternal kingdom. We have the choice. He doesn't force us. I don't know about you, but I want to say a yes again to Jesus tonight. Lord, with whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I want to be ready. How many of you would like to join me right now and also raise your hand? Lord, we want to be there. We want to be ready. 
There's so many distractions in this world. There's so many voices that are, that are clamming for our attention. There's so many distractions in this journey. But Lord, you've made it so, you've made it so plain, so clear, that there's coming a day very soon when all my labors and trials are o'er, I'll be safe on that beautiful shore. Lord, tonight, with our hands raised, this is also a way of us saying, opening our hearts to say, Lord, whatever it takes, I want to be ready for that day. If that's your desire, would you say amen? amen. <sighs> Friends, I happen to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Every Christian in the world who believes that Jesus is returning is an Adventist. That's what the word means. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a church that has a great history. But the literal coming of Jesus is something that I think every Christian believes in. As an Adventist, from my earliest years going to Bible school, church, I learned songs, I learned memory verses from the Bible. I learned about, I will wear a crown in my father's house. All of these songs aren't just ways of entertaining kids. It's a way of instilling something in a person's heart that stays there for eternity. I love Jesus more than anything. There's nothing in this world. I was telling my friend Jim over here, I think we shared this with you, that four months before that terrible fire took everything there in paradise, we sold our home and moved to Sun City West, you know, a few, a few hours up the road. And we went back up to paradise about three or four months later when they finally allowed his, we knew our house was the house that we had owned had gone, but we had, we had some stuff in a storage container, a storage facility. We didn't know whether that storage facility even survived. Secretly, I was hoping it didn't because it was full of stuff. But when we looked at what where our house was, that little writing more I had, little chunk of melted aluminum and metal, there was nothing. And you know what thought went through my mind? This is what it's going to look like, even more so, when Jesus comes. So I better not have any of my but I might have met my heart and my soul into that stuff. Tonight, I want to attach my heart and my soul again to Jesus.